Cindy, I gotta get back to work. <laughs> Cindy Wang, I'd like to invite Cindy Wang up. Uh, Uh, Cindy Wang from the Center for Global Development. She's a senior policy, a visiting policy fellow there. She works on issues related to development effectiveness, fragile and conflict affected states, and strengthening U.S. development policy. Most recently, Ms. Wang was the Deputy Vice President for S Sector Operations at the Millennium Challenge Corps. Corporation where she oversaw the strategic direction and implementation of a $2 billion portfolio. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. The Center for Global Development does not take institutional positions, so I offer these thoughts in my personal capacity. We face challenges in the world today, as every generation has. But we also have significant opportunities. As part of an integrated strategy that includes diplomacy and defense, global development is a high return opportunity. Investing in development, less than 1% of the federal budget works. American leadership and our collaboration with partners has helped cut child mortality and extreme poverty in half, and we are on the way to an AIDS-free generation. These investments make us safer and more secure. Admiral James Stavridis, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, has said, without funding diplomacy and development, you ensure that we will end up spending more on hard power. Development is also about prosperity here at home. Promoting growth opens the door to business opportunities and American jobs. 10 of our 15 largest trade partners, like South Korea, were once recipients of foreign aid. But perhaps most important of all, turning toward big problems, leading with our head and heart. These are American values. Our commitment to these values is fundamental to our leadership in the world today. So development delivers results, advances our interests, and is a key pillar of our global leadership. An American leadership with the support of our allies is more necessary than ever. We have important opportunities to improve health around the world. We need to fight the last mile to end HIV and AIDS, and respond to diseases like Zika and Ebola by strengthening local and re regional capacity to stop their spread. We have the opportunity not only to make America the clean energy superpower, to, but to support other countries pursue development that achieves growth and reduces emissions. Latin America presents opportunities to invest in the prosperity of our own hemisphere and help address the root causes of violence and insecurity, especially in Central America. And we must continue our great work to improve food security and nutrition for millions and to help turn on the lights and bring electricity to millions more, especially in Africa. And across all we do, we must advance gender equality. We cannot fulfill our collective potential if we leave half the population behind. And our work must be informed by the compelling evidence on the multiplier effect of investing in women and girls. Seizing these opportunities will help prevent crisis in the future, but we must still respond to the crises of today. We cannot turn away from the more than 60 million people who have been forced to flee their homes, the highest number since World War II. Many are fleeing the very same terrorists that we are fighting. Now is the time to do more by welcoming more refugees to America without discrimination based on race, religion, or ethnicity and providing more support to refugee hosting countries. And we cannot defeat violent extremism when millions of people see a future of continued injustice and lack of opportunity. Development programs can help address underlying issues that make communities more vulnerable to violent extremism, getting directly to the causes of this problem, not only addressing the symptoms. And we cannot ignore how so many challenges are exacerbated by the plague of corruption. It's not just the Panama Papers. The scale of corruption, as much as $2.6 trillion a year, is a systemic threat that demands a robust response. So to promote inclusive growth and solve shared problems, we must collaborate closely with our full range of partners and help strengthen them. This includes ensuring that organizations like the United Nations are modernized to confront 21st century problems 
and it includes doing more with America's unique strengths, our social entrepreneurs, our innovators. We must, of course, use our development resources wisely. We need to collect more and better data and use it systematically. And we must hold our own institutions and partners accountable for transparency and, above all, results. As Americans, we believe that everyone deserves a chance to succeed. That is why we give the most to private charities and respond so generously to humanitarian crisis. I believe that this November, Americans will once again affirm that they believe in engaging the world, building bridges, not walls, not only because it is the right thing to do, but the smart thing as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wendy, yes? Um, hi, Cindy. Hi. Um, you mentioned a couple of the reasons why development is important, um, helping to fight violent extremism, uh, because people then have a reason for hope, don't have to choose a violent way of life, uh, dealing with corruption, which obviously has uh, a lot of implications for American investment. But since a lot of America believes that 40% of our GDP goes to foreign assistance when only 1% does, mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit more, for the record, why this is an American's national interest? We, of course, have a large heart. It's part of our value system, but it goes way beyond our value system. So could you chat about that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. And you picked on you know, some of the most compelling examples, I think, that if, if we can make you know, an investment now, we can save dollars in the future. And I would just, I already quoted Admiral Stavridis. Um, and he recently wrote um, an article just yesterday about how it, that he had been advocating for increased investments by USAID in Niger because they were achieving such strong results addressing some of those fundamental causes of lack of hope and lack of a feeling that there can be justice in the future. Um, so I think that there are um, multiple challenge, and I mean, the example of Ebola, which others have spoken about as well, is, is also such a clear example to me of if we don't strengthen the local and regional capacity of the health systems that are elsewhere in the world, the threat very rapidly meets us here at home. And so those, I think, are two wonderful examples, but they do run the gamut, and it is such an important reminder. I saw a recent poll that people do think that it's 24% you know, of our budget, and it is less than 1%, and there is, and it's not to say, we do need to invest more in data and make our case, but it's already a very strong one, and we have to get out there and make that case to the American people. Thank you. Uh I have a quick question, then I want to go to Bill. It's not actually a quick question. It's an, it's an issue that I want you just to reflect on, if you could. Um, we have to do more for refugees and support them and host countries. You noted that. But they are having a transformative effect and not always a good one in the reaction that is taking place in Europe yes. and in some of the neighboring countries that's, whose stability are, are being undermined. President Obama has called for an emergency summit mm -hmm. this year. What would be the specifics that we could reflect in our platform about the broader responsibility of the world community and mm -hmm. us providing leadership right. to address the many ramifications of the refugee crisis? Yeah, um, and I, I think it's very critical that he's hosting this summit um, at the UN General Assembly this year. Some of the targets that have been put out first to increase financing. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that to address the scale of the crisis, we do need to commit dollars. Um, and I also think it, what's one thing that's fundamental is recognizing that the old model, people spoke of the you know, post-World War II model, of humanitarian assistance um, no longer holds. The vast majority of Syrian refugees living in Lebanon and Jordan are not living in camps. And the duration of displacement has extended from a three mm -hmm. to five year window to much, much longer. So I think it's time for, for a, a reconceptualization almost right. of the kind of support that is needed in these situations. If you're displaced for five, 10, 20 years, and um, you, know, you really need the full range of support, which by the way, there are many compelling economic studies that show that in the long run, refugees contribute a great deal in terms of economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Shaheen mentioned the innovation that's brought, but there are short-term costs, and we cannot be naive about those. Okay. And so I think we have to reconceptualize, add more resources, and, um, and, and really get the global community to take on more refugees. Thank as well. you. Bill? Uh, 
on occasion, we end up uh, with some of these good goals at cross purposes. Um, I'm thinking, uh, among other things, of the fact that um, some of our, um, some of the efforts of uh, multinational agencies to uh, electrify parts of the world are leading to rapid increases in the use of fossil fuel at uh, obvious mm. odds with our um, uh, goals set out in Paris. Can you um, provide some advice for the committee on language or ideas that might make it easier to make sure that Americans' uh, involvement in those multilateral agencies was instead directed toward clean energy? Um, yes, great question. And when I worked at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we were very involved in Power Africa. That was something we looked at very closely. And I think you already indicated part of the solution, which is how can we encourage investment in clean energies? How can we help with technology transfer so that, again, the innovation in America is brought to bear in developing countries? And I also think there are really creative solutions. Um, a hat tip to some folks at the Center for Global Development who have been looking at um, not in energy per se, but looking at in the case of forests, you know, how can we encourage agriculture in a way that also reduces emissions? And so I think you have to ha have innovative solutions overall to address the climate change issue. And I, and I think one great way to do that is to start to pay for those results um, when we see them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And